uh let's start with let's start with nick nick you're the opening opening gambit wait uh, you did okay. good morning future people oh yeah fuck yeah good morning future people it's uh <laughs> monday september 9th 2024 i don't know it's uh it's, it's monday traveled all weekend i'm all i'm all sorts of discombobulated but there are demos regardless nick show it to you anyway if you create a data warehouse stream client we'll load in an aws config and authenticate in the future we may not want to authenticate for a um, multitude of reasons but for now this is the approach we're taking particularly if this is running on sdf we should already have valid credentials to authenticate and talk to uh via aws firehose to our kinesis stream which then goes the redshift. Are you confused yet? Um, so then essentially what the publish looks like is it's a put record directly into the firehose stream, which goes to Kinesis, then the redshift serverless. And uh, this little put, uh, put record at line 53, followed by the record we want to show at line 55, and then 56, what we're sending over the wire is how we publish it to said stream. Um, and that's pretty much it right now. Uh, this code is basically take one down, pass it around, and it runs as a pet task in SDF. So that's sort of an end-to-end -end flow of billing events that we would be receiving. And actually, it might make sense really briefly to show you what a billing event looks like at present. Um, we grabbed a bunch of metadata. We're, we're going to iterate and talk about this as we like productionize it uh, this week. But... Essentially, uh, we have things like active resource count, the description of the change if we need it, workspace BK, um, uh, snapshot address, change that ID, the location, whether it was local or hosted. The, these things aren't necessarily correct. They're just a bit of dummy data right now, and we're, and we're sending dummy data over the wire on a, apply to change the head. But that's where the next bit of work lies here. So, yeah, that concludes my demo. Sweet. Very good. Let's uh let's go to Paul Stack since you're in the airport. Yeah. Okay. Let's see how this works on airport Wi-Fi. Uh, yeah. So continuing building the suite of uh, tools in the workspaces or in the off API off portal. Um, so last week we had a a suggestion for somebody they needed to change a workspace owner, so they needed a transfer. So I actually added the ability to do that right now. So. My work email is the owner. My personal email is an editor. I can actually make both of them owners. I can make my uh, an editor that goes with it. And then, of course, like I've just transferred the ownership into uh, the right person. So it's very easy to be able to change the role and push stuff through. And of course, like a workspace can have multiple, multiple owners. There will always only be one creator of a workspace. But uh, when we start to be able to have uh, organizations, you'll want multiple roles, et cetera, et cetera. So that takes us down this path. Uh, really short. Sentence. Cool. Awesome. Love it. Let's do, uh, let's do Wendy. Yeah. So I'm going to show off some new improvements to the UI that are part of a multitude of turns of sort of increasing user friendliness of our uh, application. Uh, one of those is the sort of holistic introduction of these icons that represent what type of component you're looking at. So down here, we've got uh, some frames. And this icon now replaces the drop down menu over here. And if you want to change the type up frame, uh, the hope is that these icons will become pretty, like, at a glance, understandable to users who understand our product. They're over here in the diagram outline. Uh, they're even featured in the new set type option, the drop down, where you can do the same thing as that drop down on the right. Um, yeah. And they're also featured on the component card up here. Nice. Uh, the other feature, uh, and I'm going to click on here to show it, is you can now collapse multiple frames at once. Uh, you can select multiple frames and collapse them, or there's a hotkey to collapse all frames. So let me just do the hotkey. Boom, everything collapses simultaneously expanding or i could select just these two frames and collapse those two yeah nice. this will make hopefully collapsing a lot more intuitive yeah. uh, in terms of how it works yeah. uh and not being able to collapse more than one frame at a time was getting annoying for a few <laughs> people who had tried out the feature so yeah cool those are great additions 
Um, let's do Zach. Okay. Sharing my screen. Okay, I'm going to demo uh, the the rest of the admin dashboard. So the first thing is I added a text index to the users table, so we can search uh, by partial data to find workspaces owned by certain users. So um, my database has about like 100,000 dummy users in it, but you can just do that system in there. I only have one that's that, it's me. Uh, now that I've found this workspace, I can set the component concurrency limit. For example, I can clear it out to restore it to be the default. Uh, I can also search directly by workspace ID, for example, find this workspace again, or I can load the change sets uh, and search by change set ID. So one thing we noticed when we were uh, dealing with the, the deploy when the, the, uh, the, the upgrades didn't work exactly as expected because there were some workspaces that were broken is that some of our errors have one ID, some have the other, some only have a snapshot address in them. Uh, and until we have that instrumentation everywhere, it might be good to be able to search by different stuff. So you can search directly by the snapshot address, for example, um, and you can find that workspace. So I wanted to be able to search by all that. So I added that in and then also we can save and replace snapshots. So here in change set one, I have a region with three security groups here at change set two. I don't have anything at all. So I'm going to save snapshot one to disk, change set one. And then I'm going to open up change set two here. I'm going to replace it. Okay, and so it got the updated hash. And then if we reload, we see that we have replaced the snapshot for that change set. So this will allow us to download snapshots, make changes to them with local tools, and then replace them for a change set for a certain workspace in order to mitigate any errors uh, in, in the live production instance. Uh, and that's my demo. That is a good demo. Wow. Like this, it's the kind of thing you hope nobody ever needs. And also, you know, you're gonna. You know, <laughs> like at some point, this is going to go weird. Um, that's awesome. Victor, take us home. Hello. With your with your SI logo in the background. Yeah. Looking so, sharp. Thank you. Oh, my God. How do I share a screen again? There we go. Uh, so this last week, I worked with the help of uh, two of our Johns, our resident Johns, that would be Yobelinas and Watson in making API tests uh, work. And I've been debating out the best way to show this because like, it's very developer-centric. Most of the work was to make our work easier. Uh, so maybe let's start with running it. We have a new folder in our system, which is the bin uh, API tests, SI-API tests. Uh, and it's like a very simple Dano setup. And you can like, just run it by passing a couple of, of arguments. You pass the SDI, FDF API URL, the auth API URL. I'm doing everything locally here. Uh, and then a user email and a password. This user, it has to be in the test user role in Auth0. So we don't want to like open the API requests for everyone, even though this is what this does. So now you have to like actually authenticate for now, uh, like set the authentication for the user, and then you can just run it from a single command. It takes a little while, but it does like a single API request from the Auth portal to get a token. And then it and the auth portal returns like an SDF token that can do whatever requests you want. And yeah, like it brings out a test report of all the tests it ran. Uh, and we got that set up as an action too. So now during our crons, this API test action will run, which is like every 15 minutes, but it also can be run manually. And you can see the logs here. And it does like a test matrix. So it runs every job in a separate container instance. I guess I don't know if I should call them containers, but in a separate task instance. And you can pretty easily do see the log here. It'll like log out. Oh, is it not? Is John around? Watson. I guess he is he's, in, on, I, he's in a car. Okay. We, we used to log every web request we were doing. So it would be easy to follow. I guess it got, mm. got removed but it would be easy to put it back in. Uh, anyway, we also got, uh, let's go to the bin folder here. Uh, SI API tests. 
Just wanted to show you a test and look how simple it looks. Create and use variant, I guess, a good one. Create any components. So everything is like wrapped around this SDF API client. And we have a list of the endpoints separately. So we can like type check uh, the arguments and the and like the, the, the method itself. And yeah, I separately really do the SDF call. You get response, you validate it. Uh, we have a little wrapper here, run a temporary chain set, which does what our integration tests kind of do, which is like it sets up a chain set, uh, it runs things on that, and then it destroys it afterwards. Uh, and I think that is it. But oh my right. God, how do I stop sharing my screen? I don't know how to do computers today. Sorry, guys. I understand. <laughs> there you go. It's a play. Uh, but yeah, this is like for API tests and it's running on a cron because we couldn't validate easily after a merge, right? Because we don't have an instance running, but you can easily see how this will become uh, like the framework onto which we build our stress tests too, because you just run a thousand of them instead of five and that'll probably do it. <laughs> totally. Great. Uh, fantastic. Any other last minute additions, walk-ons? Going once. Going twice. Sold. All right. See you later.